Well, thank you very much, Temina. I think it's been really a wonderful afternoon, uh, a very comprehensive picture of uh, what the problems are in the space, what the solutions can be in this space. Uh, before saying anything else, I'd just like to extend thanks uh, primarily to uh, Carson Cristiano for organizing this afternoon for us, uh, to Claire Walsh, to Marianne Bates, uh, to Temina, and uh, also, of course, to Ted and uh, our Michael and uh, Catherine and our other hosts. So thanks to all of them. So, look, I mean, social science research at its best should be about understanding these very, very complex interlinkages that exist between human behavior on the one hand and the natural environment around us on the other hand when we, when we think about climate change problems. So, to my ears, the day started on a very depressing note in the sense that, you know, if you're in this room, you know climate change is a major problem. Uh, you may not have known that it was a problem for causing civil war and crime and killing of witches and all kinds of other, other bads that uh, may not have been keeping you awake at night. So in a sense, I think where we started off was learning that maybe things are even worse than we thought and that our human vulnerability to climate change is more comprehensive and exists in many more dimensions than may be obvious if you just think about sea levels rising or something of this type. Uh, this very broad, very surprising set of outcomes that exist, these painful trade-offs that seem to, to exist between the goals of development economists, which are, you know, raising welfare, raising incomes, and, and, and the goal of, of uh, the environmental health of the planet. Uh, some of these more depressing behavioral effects, such as the rebound effect, right? You, you undertake a well-intentioned policy to make things better, People adapt their behavior, and as they adapt their behavior, an intervention such as this, this air conditioner uh, rebate program can actually make things worse. So, so all of these are sort of depressing ways of thinking about human nature and human vulnerability. Um, but there, after this now, we kind of move to the promise. And in my mind, I am an academic, but in my mind, you know, a great deal of thinking about the promise of addressing this problem has to do with the nature of using the intelligence that got us into this problem in the first place to try to figure out how to get, get out of it again, right? So I, I wanna just try to put three broad themes that I think unify the otherwise rather disparate research that's been uh, presented today. So the first of these is the integration of engineering prowess with actual policymakers who make the real decisions that matter on the ground and researchers who care about doing applied work. So I think virtually every project that you saw today has an integration of this type, okay? There's, there's a better mousetrap that is in the picture and it may be a better contract, it may be a better financial service, it may be a, truly a better technology. There's some form of engineering that has created a new possibility that looks like it may be promising. There are a set of implementers on the ground who have to buy into this thing. They have to be interested. They have to be willing to experiment. They have to be willing to try things out. They have to be willing to collaborate and take that risk, and it is a real risk. And then there's the fundamental epistemological question of establishing evidence. How do we figure out whether these things work or they don't work? So in order to move forward in this space, you really need advances in all three of those dimensions. And I think that virtually every single project that we saw today had that kind of unification. It's very hard for me to see how we make any progress on this type of problem, a problem of this depth, without that kind of collaboration. The second thing, I think there's been a very careful consideration of heterogeneity throughout the presentations that took place today. So just, just to give a few examples, you know, in terms of uh, Marshall and Ted's talk this morning, you know, where are these specific places in the world where vulnerability to climate in a political sense are the greatest, right? What are the determinants of that? What are the, what are the climactic determinants? What are the socioeconomic and political determinants? Where should we be looking to identify these very vulnerable locations? Uh, in terms of this final uh, presentation, extremely heterogeneous effects across two apparently comparable appliances, right? And, and, you know, after the fact, it's fairly obvious that I don't turn my refrigerator on and off. I mean, the result makes perfect sense, but it's not something that you would have thought of very easily going in. Uh, in terms of, of uh, Paulina's presentation, right? This very careful consideration of how do the features of the contract and the prices determine the types of people who participate and ultimately determine the efficacy of what happens in the end, and then uh, the presentation on the, the Strasser Rice, you know, not just to consider carefully who are the individuals that sit on the land that is itself most exposed to this type of flood risk, but what are the ways that the interventions can be structured to help those 
sort of doubly vulnerable people the most, right? So these kinds of considerations of heterogeneity are very important in terms of thinking through where do you do things first? You can't do everything all at once everywhere, right? So even if you find something that's really promising, even if you run these trials and you find something that works, where do you do it? You have to understand this kind of heterogeneity well. I think there's been a very impressive consideration of that. And then finally, at this point has been hit many times, but I want to hit it again. The scientific rigor of the evidence base that is being built through this type of research is something that is really new in this area. So I, I remember I participated eight years ago in a, a conference in Washington, which was uh, run by the, the Global Environment Facility of the United Nations, where they were basically saying, look, we understand that you, know, you people out there in kind of public health and development are using you know, these very rigorous statistical techniques to try to understand what works and what doesn't. We don't really think this stuff can be applied to environmental problems, but we're curious to understand if it might be able to. And so we had a, a multi-day workshop. We combed the research that was available, brought in a lot of really good people to talk about this, and there really was a sense at the end of the workshop that we had not convinced the policymakers at that point in time that it was possible to build a rigorous scientific evidence base on this type of question. So in that sense, I think it's extremely exciting to see so much research coming together around this area, not uh, on both sides of the cause and effect feedback loop, right? Not just in terms of what are the interventions that allow humans to change their behavior towards the environment, but also what are the, the interventions that allow humans to change their vulnerability vis-a-vis -vis changes that have already been set in place in the environment, right? These are both critical welfare pathways. So, I think this SEGA JPAL uh, alliance brings together a very large share of the people in the world who are doing really rigorous work in this area. This does not mean one has to run around and randomize everything. I mean, we see in this last presentation of extremely credible, clear, transparent, easily interpreted evidence that comes from the natural rules of the implementation of a program and a, and a clever use of statistics to, to think about uh, causal inference in that environment. So, I just really want to put this out there that uh, this can seem like a very hopeless problem. And I think a great deal of the political uh, inertia that exists in this space comes from this sense of hopelessness. So I think it's very exciting. I think we have some very promising but very preliminary evidence here. And again, the goal of what we are about as a, as a research collective is not to have a couple of studies, you know, one over here and one over there that are, that are difficult to uh, associate with each other and that live in different spaces. The goal is to be able to yardstick all of the obvious interventions in a specific policy space against each other with a common uh, measure of efficacy, a common measure of cost effectiveness, and really to be able to say, what works, what doesn't work, and where are the most effective places to put our money. So that's the underlying objective here. I think what we've seen today is something that's a very exciting start in this area, and uh, you know, we, we appreciate your support in terms of being able to move further with this as, as the years pass. So thank you very much.